Praise the Lord. It is another beautiful day that the Lord has made and we will be glad in it. And I'm so thankful to God for the opportunity to come to your to us, to your to the household of, of God and minister the word of the Lord. I'm gonna be sharing a message um, which I titled What Do You Look For in Choosing a Spouse? What are you looking for? in a man when you want to get married do you look for love do you go for love you want a man that will love you how do you determine someone that will love you love is very important but if you consider if you base your judgment on choosing a spouse based on love you will end up um, breaking your heart you know you end up breaking your heart you know love is very important but love is not always um, the main thing when looking for a spouse I'm gonna let us I'm gonna tell us what is very important the important thing the vital ingredients you need when choosing a spouse amen but before I do so I just want to emphasize on something that is trending should I use the word trending on social media space you know with the help of social media we have a lot of preachers that try to indoctrinate us into their own belief or system of worship and they want you to know that this is the best way you should serve God you know they even tell you the type of gospel songs to listen to I heard a preacher saying that uh, one of these songs that we love we make a miracle worker is it's not I, I don't even want to mention it because I felt so so disappointed you know that someone could say that are you are you um are you the worship are you the one we are worshiping with such song you know and i felt i felt so 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 sad that we no longer emphasize our teaching on what the bible says the scriptures interpreting the scripture excavating the scripture you know but we just want to you know kind of uh, redact the word of God to suit our understanding. I recall a few years ago when I was preaching ag um, against tithing, how people, how preachers, you know, speak about tithing and telling people if you don't tithe, God will not bless you. I opposed it and I, I used Bible to, to back it up. I said, that's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Any preacher doing so is trying to He's trying to bring his imaginative thought into fruition by you for you to believe that if you don't tithe, you know, God will not bless you. That's 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 fallacious statements for someone to say is a complete fallacy, and it's nowhere in the Bible. Even when the Mal uh, Malachi 3 the quote is God wasn't speaking to you, God was speaking to the priest. The prophecy of Malachi was about the priests, the Levites, how they were robbing God with the tithes and offering. You know, when you read 8 and 9, the Bible says they were robbing um, um, people from their wage, the wage earners. And tithing is not for Gentiles. It was, in the Old Testament, it was the Israelites, not even for me and you. It was a law for the Israelites. It's not for me and you. So why are we making it a universal thing that we, you have to tithe? And they tithed food items, not even money. So now people are exploiting people that are, we are that are not called by God, going to the ministry just to steal from you and telling you unless you tithe, God cannot bless you. Is I have never tithed, never. And I take care of those that even tithe. I go to churches that they tithe. I'm not against them, but don't tell someone that God can bless you. So a young man that you know used to attend my ministry here you know then he heard me preach that the man was so heartbroken because he's a um uh, a good tither you know and uh, he gives good donations to the non-profit but he told me after listening to that message that he wanted to have a talk with me and he came to my office and we had a chat and he was telling me about a particular pastor that a well known pastor that preaches about tithing you know and that is his pastor and could you be bigger than that pastor that's that's the problem with Christ 
most Christians, spirit of inferiority complex, disturbing them. Who made you to think that that pastor is bigger than me? What made you to think? He has a platform. He preaches on TBN. People watches him. He's well known. And so what? What made you? In his sacred place, does he serve God better than me? We are not serving people. So you don't have to compare me with your big pastor. Who told you he's a general in God? I have dealt with demons. I have dealt with principalities and powers. I have dealt with spiritual wickedness. Generals are known with the battles they fought. Not with the money they steal from the poor. Not by buying private jets and what. You don't have to speak to me in that tone. I say, listen, if you want to tithe, go ahead and tithe. I'm not against you. But tithing had made a lot of people to be stingy towards the work of God. In the actual sense, in the New Testament, they didn't tithe. They gave everything they had. But what am I against? I'm not against your pastor preaching to you about tithing. I'm against your pastor telling you, if you don't tithe, God will not bless you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And devil is the father of all liars. I told him that. I said, he said he can't make any further donation. I said, please, you, we want you to give generously. If you want to give grudgingly, take it to you, add it to whatever tithe you're paying. I can test, tell you he, he became broke after that moment. Tithe doesn't make you rich. It doesn't make you rich. So it's something, it's a psychological, I call such pastors, psycho-emotional pastors. Psycho-emotional pastors. So later, another man, that another person that had that encounter with me came back and told me that his pastor repented from preaching about tithing. <clears throat> this is a message I've been preaching for decades. His pastor repented a few years ago. Was it last year or two years ago? In a popular pastor, a US-based pastor repented and said all oh, his book about tithing, he was going to shred it. And the man apologized to me. I said, you don't need to apologize to me. Who is losing? If I want to enrich from the poor, I will tell you about tithing. And I'll, listen, you can be rich preaching the wrong message with this scripture, with the Bible. There are things I can interpret wrongly to exploit from people, but God forbid that I will do that. I rather work hard. I have a, I have businesses here and here, not just one or two. I have businesses in the United States, in the United States that makes money for me. And I use my money to take care of the people of God. <clears throat> the poor, whether you a, a, a church goer, even a satanist, if you have a problem, I'm in a position to help you, I will do it. That's the that's only religion I practice, James chapter 127. I don't segregate. So I want you to have a personal relationship with God. Don't let anyone deceive you into thinking you have to worship God in this way. If what you're doing, you are at peace with yourself, please keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's very important. Once you are into these things, you are at peace with God, and you listen to a preacher, please check the scriptures. What I'm preaching to you, Brother Paul said in the Bible, Apostle Paul said, he loved the Bereans more than Thessalonians because each time he preaches the gospel to the Bereans, the Bereans will go after hearing from him and search the scripture to know whether Paul was speaking the truth or Paul was trying to manipulate them. <clears throat> So the Bereans will go and reach but, uh, and search the scriptures. But when he speaks to the Thessalonians, they wouldn't search. They would believe Paul. So you make me a better preacher when I speak to you and you go and search. Acts chapter 17 from verse 10 to 11. Paul was saying why he loved them. So I'm not against you. Like that young man came to my office and he wasn't happy with me preaching against tithing. I love it. He brought, he brought the scriptures and I used the scriptures to judge him. Things he said and he repented. After he, he didn't repent immediately, but after years he repented because his God of man, the pastor he was looking up to, failed him and repented. Listen, don't look up to me. Look up to Jesus, the shepherd of future. Now let's go into the message. I'm sorry this is going to have a part one and part two. Hallelujah. Let's go into the right message now. Yeah, amen. So it's important 
having a, spe um, a personal time with God as your father because God is a family man who loves relationship so the way I talk to God may be different from how you talk to God the important thing is this God is a prayer answering father who answers us in different dimensions and we communicate to him in different dimensions Elijah communicated to him in a different way from how Paul communicated Paul communicated different way from how Peter communicated so don't let your pastor teach you how to talk to your father which is God all right so the, the preacher only energizes you you know by studying the word of God with you explaining to you excavating the word of God giving you the rema you know that you need that the Bible says faith comes by uh, from hearing and hearing the word of God hallelujah so I'm not here to impose my um, understanding on you I will only share my understanding with you and I want you to go and search the scripture just as Paul said he loved the bearing for how they searched the scripture each time they heard him you know preach the gospel uh, Acts of Apostles chapter 17 from verse 10 uh, to 11 hallelujah but today I'm gonna speak about marriage what do you look for when you are choosing a spouse especially the ladies what are you looking for I mean I've, I've seen a lot of things you know counseling um, some marriages here and I, I understand that one thing I've come to note is that most people going through a divorce they are not out of love they are not going through this divorce process because they don't love each other anymore no they don't love each other anymore they still love each other that's why sometimes the divorce is so messy you know either the woman wants to hurt the man or the man wants to hurt the woman because it feels like i i still love this person but i don't want to let go so what do you look for when you want to get married you say oh i need love how do you determine that this guy loves you is it because he took you to bed and you felt so good and you were like oh man I love this guy I want to settle with him no when you look for a guy because of his looks appearance he has six packs three packs 12 packs and you said this is what I need in a man you are digging your your downfall don't marry a guy because of his looks love is good but love is not what a woman should look for in a man you know what are you what, then what is that stuff that a woman needs from a man you need a man that has a vision hallelujah a man with a vision if the man lacks vision please run from such person i'm being honest with you i'm not trying to tell you about the principles of marriage you want to know about the principles of manage, marriage read first corinthians chapter 7 down to chapter 8 these two chapters 7 first corinthians 7 and 8 if you want to read more about marriage you know her brother paul wrote to the uh, brethren in ephesus the church in ephesus ephesians uh, ephesus yeah ephesians chapter 5 from verse 20 to 32 you know that was the letter he wrote to the brethren there please about christ how christ loves you know uh, loves us, that we should love rather how Christ loved the church the man should love how Christ loved the church there's a lot of things you have to note there but I'm gonna tell you the important thing to look for in a man ask the man where does he see this union in the next five years test the vision of that man because marriage is something that is a mystery yet undefined by God to us I, I regard marriage as an institution governed by God every day we have new intakes every day but in today's world people get married for the wrong reason getting married they already have plan B oh if this fails to work man plan B you will see people getting married because oh this guy posts something unique on social media oh flashy house flashy cars flashy wristwatches oh i'm, I'm in love you, you tell somebody will be professing love immediately 
those things are very deceitful. What is the vision of that person you want to get married? Ask the person. Sometimes they don't have vision. That's why you see men these days, they want a, man, a woman that is submissive. But ask, ask the question. A man came and he was like, I'm going to end this marriage. The woman is not submissive. I'm like, really? Not submissive? Why is she not submissive? The man gave his explanations. And after listening to both of them, I asked the, um, the woman, why did you love this man? Why, why? Why did you marry this man? Is it because of his looks? You love him? says, no. I married him because I thought he was a man with vision. He could bring me closer to God. I married him. He had nothing when I married him. So I married him because of the vision and he became successful and the marriage crumbled. Then I asked the man. The man said, oh, I married her. She looks beautiful. She's what I need in a woman. I said, okay. I told the woman, can I talk to your husband privately? She said, yes. Then I asked the man, you said before your wife that she's no longer submissive to you. The man said, yes. I said, what is your understanding of submissiveness? What do you think? What should a submissive wife look like? He said, she's very disrespectful. I said, you're still using English town to, to quantify what you just told me. Explain it so a layman can understand it. What is your understanding of being disrespectful? I said, okay, when you proposed to this woman, did you propose with a ring? He said, yes. How did you propose? Did the woman kneel down to accept your ring? He says, no. Who knelt down? You knelt down. He said, he knelt down. I said, from your understanding of being submissive, who was submissive? You that knelt down <laughs> and the woman was standing who was submissive, who was loyal, who was begging for her acceptance, who showed from your understanding of being submissive, who was submissive. The guy said, he? I said, when was the last time you knelt down before your wife? He says, apart from that day, I asked her to marry me. Oh, really? So you started it? If you need a submissive person, you were broke and you were submissive. To what made you? Was it a complex issue that made you to kneel down to propose to this woman? Then all of a sudden, you can't kneel anymore. She never knelt before you. You knelt before her. So in actual sense, you were the submissive freak. You were the one submissive. Now I'm asking you, what is her offense that made you not to love her anymore? And you say she's not submissive. Have you been listening to some people? I said, listen to me. When you read Ephesians um, chapter 5, 22 to 23, it talks about how you should love just as Christ loves the church. That's how you should love. Now, wh why did Paul you know, use that to explain the love of God to the church? That is us. And how a man should love. Because... God loves us in advance. He loved us in advance while we were yet sinners. You have to love your wife in advance. If you have a vision, knowing that if I love this woman, if I take care of this woman, she will change. God died for us, sacrificed for us in advance while we were yet sinners. The Bible says Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. The gospel was not preached, but demonstrated. So why this woman was being disloyal to you, being not submissive to you, what have you done to show her love? What have you done to correct her? Instead, you want to go straight to divorce. Jesus saw us as sinners, unworthy of his grace unworthy of salvation but he knew because he had a vision jesus loved us based on the vision he foresaw that man would change what vision have you seen about your woman you lack the vision that's why you are going in for divorce and the woman was begging you please don't divorce me 
please don't divorce me. But you said, no, no, no. I need a divorce. I'm tired of this marriage. I'm done. I'm done. Because you lacked vision. And she was crying. And she said, tell me my sin. I have been so faithful to you. But you, because you had an option, B, plan. You had an exit room. But she felt she married for the right reason. But the man married for the wrong reason. You can see the compatibility wasn't there from the start. So it's very important. The woman should ask the man. Because when a woman is in love, she is in. So how do you see this marriage in the next five years? Where do you think this marriage will take us to? The man was literally broke. She was the breadwinner. And she fell in love. The man knelt down. The man was very, the man was very loyal. Very, very submissive to the marital vows until he started seeing money. So after speaking to him, the man realized and he told me the truth. He was the one cheating. He was the one messing up. And he just needed an exit plan. He had no reason to divorce the wife. Just the fact that he lost the vision. He lost the understanding of what marriage is. Marriage is not a bed of roses. Whoever tells you marriage is a bed of roses, that person is deceiving you. But you can make your marriage filled with bed of roses. You can decide. <clears throat> not everything that happens, you share to the world. My wife and I, we have gone through a lot. It's the one that we want you to see that you will see. The one that we don't want you to see because it makes no sense to share. It cannot impact you positively. We don't share. By the way, she told me the other time she would like us to have uh, a couple moment, like um, husband and wife moment and share. I said, whenever you're, you know, you're ready, I'm in. I remember that when we got married, my wife said, hey, I want a man that will lead. I want my husband to lead. I was very happy. Ooh, you know, men, African men, we love to be the leaders. We want to be the leader. So she said, I want my husband to be the leader. I was so happy, so excited. But I never knew that she played the first one on me. So she said, hey, honey, you be the leader in everything. I was happy. So leader of the house. But literally, I am a ceremonial leader. The woman is the leader in actual sense. And she said, honey, you know, you being the leader... I just want, you are the head of the house. That's what she said. You are the head. But you have been the head. Let me just be your neck. So we can walk together. I said, of course. She said, the neck and the head walk together. I said, of course. Until one day, I realized that the head cannot function without the neck. It's the neck that turns the head around. And I realized that she played the first one on me. Now, being the leader, Christ says, Love your wife like I love the church. My understanding of the word of God, I am a servant leader. Leadership in marriage, when a man is a leader, you are to serve. You are a servant to your wife, to your family. The only way your followers can emulate good works of Christ in you is when you serve. So when the Bible tells you about leadership. The man being a leader is not telling you to be autocratic, to be controlling. Once you are controlling, you are a witch. Witchcraft is not when you, you use voodoo or whatever. No, witchcraft is when you manipulate someone, influence someone against her will to do your bidding. You are a witch. So be careful, women, when you pray all witches disturbing your family should die. You may eventually kill your husband. Because witchcraft... It's not only when you use voodoo, African magic, they call it, or juju or whatever, or um, sorceress to kill. No, you can be a witch based on your manipulative tendencies. So you can't manipulate. You can't put a woman in a box because you are a leader. No, I serve. I cook. I wash the dishes. And I still make money to take care of my family. And sometimes, you know, before I got married, I can watch anything I want on television. I can go to the stores and buy whatever I want to buy, buy all sort of designers I want. But now, I'm scared. 
If I'm not scared of my, my wife, I'm scared of my children. I'm scared of what I watch on TV. I may be watching some programs and my children will come. I say, oh, I change it because I don't want them to watch it because I think it's, it's not right nice for them to watch such. You know, I change it to cartoon. Servant leadership. I lead by example. And my wife, before we drive the car, before we start, if you, I will pray. I say, let us pray. And we pray. Now, when I'm not around, she emulates from what the husband, who is a servant leader. So we should have this understanding that leadership it doesn't mean that you have to influence the woman. Say, hey, you must do this. That's witchcraft. That's not leadership. Let's call a spade a spade. So be careful. When you want to settle for somebody, love is beautiful. But when people get out of, ma out of marriage and they want to divorce, they are not divorcing because they don't love each other. No, they divorce because of the understanding. They don't understand each other anymore. They don't communicate anymore. People go into divorce because of lack of understanding. So it's important, very pertinent for you to seek for that man's vision of the marriage in five years, in ten years. Say, where do you see this marriage? What's your plan? I outlined my plan for this, my union. I told my wife, the first year, this is the plan. We buy a house, we do this, this, and the way, first five years fulfilled. She saw them happen. She was like, wow. Marry a man with vision. Marry a man with vision. Marry a man with vision is very important. Always ask for the vision of the man. Let him share with you. Because the rate of divorce these days is wrong. I'm not talking about divorce based on inf infidelity. No, when someone needs a flimsy excuse to use the exit room, they always come out with whatever concocted excuses. But when you understand your wife just the way Christ understood before he died for the church, we were all sinners, busy fornicating, committing adultery, immoralities, and Christ laid his life because of the vision he had for us. He wants us to have eternal life. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes, so which means, he said, no, he didn't say for who believed, he said whoever believes will have eternal life. Uh, and I like how the Bible says, he said Christ died for us while we, while we were yet sinners. We were yet sinners, still committing sin. If you love your wife and she makes that mistake, you will see love. Instead of that simple mistake, what you will see is love if you have a vision. But a man without a vision needs an excuse to exit from the marriage. Oh, she's not submissive. The Bible says, woman, submit to your wife. How can she be submissive to you when you are a cheat? When you lie? When you have no regard for your marital vow? No, you have to activate it. You have to sacrifice something to activate it. The submissiveness from a woman. Jesus died. If Jesus had not died, all of us would still be sinning. I wouldn't be here preaching the gospel. Jesus loved us first. So you have to love first for her to respect you. You can't be a man beater and expect the woman to always be submissive to you. No. So let us preach the right message and let love reign over hate. God bless you. And I pray that this message will have an impact in your marriage. I see you sometime next week. I love you.